Well, by now, you have a qualitative understanding of proportional navigation. At the end of the last module, we posed a problem set. This module goes in detail through their solution. Welcome to Missile Guidance Fundamentals, Section 2, Module 2. Assuming pursuer velocity magnitude is constant, determine the proportional navigation law in terms of pursuer acceleration instead of flight path angle rate. Here's a picture of our pursuer with a body fixed coordinate system attached to the center of mass and the eye direction aligned out the nose. The velocity vector is also aligned with the eye direction. We'll need an inertial reference frame. And also note that the flight path angle gamma is the angle of the velocity vector relative to the inertial frame. But since we've aligned the velocity out the nose, then the flight path angle is also the angle of the body coordinate system with respect to the inertial frame. Now we're going to assume that the kinematics are confined to the IJ plane, so we have pure planar motion. And our approach to calculate or determine acceleration is to apply the vector derivative or the equation of Coriolis. Now before we proceed, let's do a little review. An inertial frame is a frame of reference where Newton's laws are valid. Here, we take the frame Fi to be referenced to the Earth as an inertial frame. A reference frame is a rigid body or a rigidly related set of points. Here, we have the body reference frame denoted Fb. A coordinate system is a measurement system assigned to a frame. We assigned the B coordinate system to the frame Fb of the pursuer. The angular velocity vector represents the rate of rotation of one frame with respect to another. We denote that with the symbol omega, and the subscript denotes the rotation of frame body with respect to the inertial frame. When taking a vector derivative, there are two things to note. One, which coordinate system is that derivative resolved in? And two, which frame is that derivative taken in? Here's the acceleration vector we seek to determine. It's resolved in the body frame. The arrow denotes that it's a vector. We determine it as the time rate of change of the pursuer velocity vector. That velocity is resolved in the body coordinate system, but the derivative is taken in the inertial frame. And in doing this, we have two components, and this is the equation of Coriolis or the vector derivative. The first component accounts for the change in vector magnitude. The second component accounts for the change in vector direction. It's a cross product between the angular velocity vector and the pursuer velocity vector. Now going back to our frames and coordinate systems, let's focus on this velocity vector. We said it was constant, so immediately we can get rid of the first term. But there is rotation in the body frame relative to the inertial frame due to the change in flight path angle. So we do have terms associated with the cross product. And this is what we now have to evaluate. Let's expand the velocity vector in terms of its components, u, v, and w, as well as the angular velocity vector in terms of its components, eta dot, chi dot, and gamma dot. And to evaluate the cross product, we're just going to use the determinant formula. Since we're confined to a plane and the pursuer velocity is aligned out of the nose, most of the elements in V and omega are zero. All we have is the axial velocity component of the pursuer and the non-zero flight path angle rate. Calculating the determinant with expansion by minors, we simply get an acceleration component in the J direction of the pursuer. That's the J direction of the body coordinate system.
Now we define velocity in terms of lowercase u, v, and w, but our only non-zero component was the axial component u. To be consistent with previous modules, we're going to set u equal to capital V. It distinguishes itself from the vector because there's no arrow above the v. As we've developed, the cross product only has non-zero component in the body coordinate system j direction. We further denote the acceleration command as AP, which is simply VP times gamma dot. Substituting in the gamma dot form of pronav into the acceleration formula gives our pronav in terms of acceleration. So there you have it, and the result makes sense because if by definition the velocity vector is aligned with the body i direction and constant, then the acceleration vector, AP, it can have no component in that i direction. Hence, it has to be perpendicular to the i direction. We've confined our kinematics to a plane, the ij plane. So therefore, the acceleration has to be along the j direction. And the math that we went through to get that acceleration, well, that just ensures that we get that direction correct. The problem is completed. So the PRONAV law is implemented as part of a feedback loop called the homing loop. And the goal of the homing loop is to get very close or directly hit the target. We've discussed two forms of PRONAV, a flypath angle form and an acceleration form. They both achieve the same result. But what's the required input for each of those laws? And then consider what systems would have to require that input data and what systems would use the output of the PRONAV law. A little open-ended there. What are the inputs? Here's the gamma dot form of pure PRONAV. The input is line of sight rate multiplied by n gives gamma dot. Acceleration form, we have a velocity term now that is an input. The output is acceleration. Now you may be wondering, since velocity is constant, why don't we group it into the block? Technically, you could do that in a simulation context. But in more complicated simulations, VP will change. And it makes sense. A pursuer velocity changes throughout its engagement with the target. So it has to be continuously updated in time. And then it's the job of the engineer to tune the N to meet the guidance system requirements. So for part B, it's very open-ended. It asks you to think about the systems that would exist before and after the guidance law. For the gamma form of PRONAV, the only input is line of sight rate. So what could measure line of sight rate? It's not like the target will tell us its state. So we're going to have to sense it somehow remotely. Uh, broadly speaking, this can be done with electromagnetic waves, and there are devices known as seekers or homing eyes that use electromagnetic energy, either actively or passively, to detect and track the target. In the active case, the homing eye emits energy and receives the reflection of that energy off of the target. In the passive case, the energy is being emitted by the target that's being tracked. Here I've shown an infrared seeker or an IR seeker that's combined with some sophisticated filter software that will produce the line of sight rate. The line of sight rate measurement is very noisy and hence the reason for the need of a filter. And the inputs to the sensor are just the real world engagement kinematics. Now, how does the system use flight path angle rate? 
Well, flight path angle rate is a command to the vehicle. It must be met by the vehicle as best as possible. Otherwise, the vehicle is at risk of not achieving a collision triangle. So to change its flight path angle rate, the pursuer is equipped with control effectors. These control effectors impart forces and moments on the body. And two potential forms are shown in the picture. You have fins or canards. Either could be servo-actuated uh, or both. Now, offhand, it's not clear how the actuators should move to produce the desired gamma dot. It's the job of the autopilot to relate the gamma dot command to the correct servo fin or servo canard motion to produce a achieved gamma dot that best meets the command. So in summary, the homing eye senses the instantaneous engagement geometry, outputs the line of sight rate, the pronav law produces the desired gamma dot for collision, and the flight control system, that's the autopilot combined with the pursuer and its control effectors, attempts to achieve the desired gamma dot. If we have the acceleration form of PRONAV, then we're gonna need another sensor in the loop. Here's the input for line of sight rate. To get VP, one option is an inertial measurement unit. An inertial measurement unit, or IMU for short, is mounted to the body and senses translational and rotational accelerations. And that data can be filtered to produce an estimate of the pursuer velocity vector. And then with those instantaneous values of VP and lambda dot, we have our desired acceleration normal to the body x-axis. The flight control system receives that command produces the correct fin or canard adjustments to achieve a desired acceleration. So from these two different forms of PRONAV, we now see implications for two different types of flight control systems. One is for gamma dot tracking, and one is for acceleration tracking. I'm not going to go into detail about the implications of the different types of flight controllers, but just understand that the implications are significant. Now, finally, this problem gets you to think about how to tune N from a control effort perspective. In the first part, we say, consider it takes control effort to change the fly path angle. What's the trend between control effort and N? And then what's one positive and one negative implication of increasing N with respect to pursuer flight control effort? So let's start with A. Initially, the change in the flight path angle in the previous three cases, we saw that Increasing N required increasing fly path angle change, or increasing N required increasing control effort initially. And initially is a key thing because greater N also meant that we achieved a collision triangle earlier, faster. So from the sense of overall throughout the engagement, how does N correspond to control effort? That's a different question, and it's not so clear right now. Which navigation constant may provide more or less control effort? Now, it turns out that for this law, there is an optimal navigation constant to minimize control effort. Uh, we'll get into that in upcoming modules, but for now, just understand that initially, increasing N means increasing control effort but throughout the course of the engagement, it's a different interpretation.
one positive thing about increasing n is that we get on a collision course faster. If we're on the collision course faster, then it's easier to correct for deviations to that collision course. Whether the pursuer is pushed off the course by a strong wind or whether the target makes an evasive maneuver, we can make those corrections better. A negative thing about increasing n is that early on, we know that we are always increasing the effort of the pursuer, meaning that we might reach some maneuverability limit. So we have to keep in mind what the maneuverability limit is of the pursuer when we adjust the navigation gain. This concludes the problem set solutions for a qualitative introduction to proportional navigation, section two, module two.